good uh, day to everybody. Um, today uh, I will tell you a little bit about the uh, basics of QNMR. Even before we start measuring, there are quite a lot of uh, things you can uh, think about uh, going into a QNMR. Uh, this work was uh, presented first um, in September 2017 at SMASH uh, conference after um, at the uh, QNMR symposium and it was well received so I hope you like it as well. So first of all, uh, let's look, uh, look at some basics. Um, the principle is uh, fairly simple. There's a long equation, although uh, the, the, uh, it is fairly simple to understand what is going on. Um, the most important thing to realize is that uh, the ratio uh, or the, the area that you get from uh, a compound integral um, that is proportional to the number of protons that are uh, in the solution. And with uh, the other known constants, you can uh, calculate how much of a certain compound you have uh, together with the uh, internal standard if you add it. There are basically three types of applications for QNMR. Uh, so the concentration of products and impurities. Uh, Measuring just the compound, you can already see down to ppm level how much is in there of uh, other compounds. Uh, you can do a purity de determination of standards for other techniques like HPLC. And um, the nice thing about NMR is that it is uh, uh, accurate and you can get a high precision. Um, and you can already, uh, with a simple Proton NMR, you can see a lot of the compounds that are present. And last but not least, you, uh, the composition of complex mixtures that has uh, increased a, uh, a lot in the last decade. A lot of um, uh, companies are working on that, uh, for instance, in metabolomics, but also profiling of uh, different food mixtures, for instance. Well, the linearity of uh, NMR is uh, very good. Um, it has a wide range and um, uh, you can measure uh, high and low concentrations quite easily. For example, um, we have a diastyl impurity in here. So uh, there's one main compound uh, which can be uh, seen, the major peak over here, which is uh, the diacetyl. However, um, uh, if you zoom in, you can see that there's much more in there. If you zoom in even further, you can still see um, several peaks. And we're going to zoom in to one certain area, one little area. Here we have two compounds that are byproducts. And uh, as low as... Uh, 7 ppm uh, still is detectable for acetaldehyde and uh, formaldehyde. And no even no external references are needed to do this kind of quantification. Now, uh, com compound impurity is uh, uh, one part, but you can also determine for uh, reference standards how pure they are. Uh, for instance, often uh, products are sold based on a 99% purity of HPLC. But as you can see in the lower picture, there are quite some impurities in here if you measure it with NMR. Uh, and on top you can see a, pic a picture of something that was measured uh, for 99%, more than 99.9% purity, both with NMR and HPLC, the same compound. On the complexity, um, yeah, let's uh, have a look at uh, wine. This uh, attracts some interest as well. And um, you can see uh, all types of compounds, for instance, glycerol, the dark acids, lactic acids, the internal standard that we used, that was amylaic acid in this case, butane diol, succinic acid. And going deeper down, you can also see proline, vitamin C, uh, gallic acid, tyrosine, 
an even adulterant, or in this case, it was actually spiked with benzoic acid. But you can even find those kind of compounds. Other um, several aspect key aspects for QNMR, and um, I want to discuss a, a couple of them. Uh, for instance, sample variation. Uh, I work at DSM in a biotech center, and uh, there we have a lot of biological variation. Also, uh, sample inhomogeneity is something that uh, can happen, of course, with any type of uh, process. And you need to be aware of this when you're doing uh, QNMR. Uh, taking a correct sample is not that easy as, uh, as sometimes is thought. Um, it's also good to keep track of your standards. Uh, nowadays you can buy standards, uh, qualified standards from several vendors, but you can uh, should also check if they change over time. And um, accurate weighing is, is, yeah, is that really that simple? I'll have a look at that in um, more detail. Um, accurate pipetting, typically, um, uh, a pipetting error of uh, 5 to 10 percent uh, is for uh, a student that coming uh, coming from the university or uh, it is quite normal however with uh, some good training you can reduce it to uh, one to five percent and uh, yeah the, this is always something that you have to be aware of and then of course there's a big choice on what pulse program to use uh, do you use a 30 or 9 degree pulse, or do you use water pre-saturation? All those kinds of uh, things can influence how quantitative your results are. I would like to uh, use the uh, Lockheed Martin principle, and uh, that says, keep it simple, you stupid. Uh, the more simple your pulse program is, the better quantifica uh, quantification results are. Now, this is a list of uh, uh, tips that we use in uh, weighing our samples. Uh, it's a long list, but I will dig, dig into that a little bit later. First of all, let's, uh, let me show how accurate you can get. So, for instance, uh, we were looking for a quantification of a standard, and uh, we wanted to get uh, as little error as possible. So, we weighed uh, uh, real uh, replicates, so including the weighing of a batch, and um, uh, yeah, with highly um, with high accuracy, we could uh, uh, get to 99.6 percent uh, standard deviation of 0.03 percent. To my knowledge, I have not seen this uh, being reported anywhere yet, but uh, I'm welcome to uh, get any tips if anybody has uh, seen improved uh, methods. So, digging into uh, those topics, um, I, uh, the list is not uh, conclusive, but quite extensive already. Uh, one of the tips is and just use neatly, um, use tweezers instead of your fingers, and uh, the residue on your fingers will show up on the balance. Uh, clean the table uh, and the weighing platform of the balance is always a good idea. Putting on an empty file and just minutes before our weighing that can help to stabilize your balance. Also check for magnetic objects, of course in the NMR room that's uh, a logical choice. To look at that. Um, use file, files with a narrow rim. That's something that you would not typically think of, but uh, having a narrow rim will uh, make sure that um, the sample that you have is either inside the file or outside of the file. And just give the file a tap before weighing. That will also ensure that either is in or out. Uh, also, do not add material while the file is on the balance. That's, of course, a good idea to make sure that everything that, uh, that you weigh is actually in the file. And close the doors 
of the bands. Stickers are uh, often handy to identify a file, however they also contain residue that uh, uh, can evaporate during weighing. Um, and uh, weight, just take your time while weighing. And store your files close to a balance. Uh, this is predominantly because of the moisture in the air. Uh, not everybody, uh, not all labs have that, that as a problem, but we in the Netherlands we have quite a lot of rain, so every now and then it can change. So the um, humidity can change and having the uh, files close to the balance makes sure that they have the same, uh, same environment as when weighing. And the last line is also about that same thing. So when buying uh, typical NMR uh, st standards, uh, we would like to have high pure compounds, things that are not uh, hydroscopic and stable over a long period of time, um, but also non-volatile, of course. They have to be soluble in whatever solvent that you're going to use. A simple compound with only a few signals that will ensure that you don't get into a crowded area. And of course, if you're uh, starting with a new project, then you have to look which areas of uh, your matrix is clean and which uh, compound will be best suitable. You might not always get all of these uh, requirements, but uh, at least get as much as possible. These are a couple of examples of uh, uh, compounds that we use. Well, then uh, back to the point of uh, relaxation uh, with a 90 degree pulse. So there's a nice equation for this. Uh, somebody else already has done the hard work developing this and uh, it's basic for uh, um, the relaxation time that you need for NMR. So the tau is uh, the interpulse delay between experiments and um, if you uh, put in a sample and the magnetization of your uh, sample will align uh, together um, on the z-axis. So the netto magnetization of your spins will be on the z-axis and as soon as you uh, give a 9 degree pulse it will uh, come from the uh, from that z-axis to the y-axis or the uh, x-axis and uh, pr uh, process back to that equilibrium. Um, if you want to uh, recover your full magnetization, um, you will have to wait. And for instance, if you're going to wait to 99% recovery, you will need to wait uh, four and a half times your T1 of that spin um, and going to 99.99% you have to wait 9.2 times your T1. That seems like a long time so um, but the, the, it's uh, the basics for uh, getting more accurate results uh, and I will dig into that a little bit more. So after uh, your sample has been uh, in the magnet for some time, uh, the magnet netto magnetization is on the z-axis so over here uh, and applying a 90 degree pulse it flips angle to the x-axis. And um, just by time, it will uh, uh, return back to the netto um, magnetization. It will return back to the magnetic field of the uh, of your NMR. So back to the z-axis. Uh, and what's uh, what's going on on the x and the y-axis? Those are the things that you actually measure. While the magnetization is uh, uh, returning back to equilibrium. So this is important for your quantification. So after 
90 pulse, uh, 9 degree pulse. Uh, the magnetization is in the equatorial plane. And uh, fast relaxing spins, they will uh, process uh, faster to equilibrium than slow relaxing spins. Uh, if you wait long enough, it will return, both will return to the z-axis and um, when you give another pulse, both will be again in the equatorial plane. Uh, the areas for both compounds will be uh, more or less constant depending on how long you have waited. If you're in a hurry and start to pulse before the system is fully relaxed, then you don't get equal area um, uh, equal areas and you get um, bigger differences with each pulse. So the ratio of areas is no longer a constant. Well, there's another way, of course, that you can try to uh, lose some time. But that's, for instance, by going for a 30 degree angle instead of a 90 degree. The principle is that uh, with the 30 degree angle, you only get uh, 15% of your uh, magnetization on the z-axis that is needs to return. However, you already have 50% of the measurements uh, in the x-y-axis. So that sounds uh, pretty interesting. Uh, in another graph, if you have a short relaxation, uh, then you get uh, uh, with a 30 degree pulse, you get the top line. So only uh, a limited amount of time needed to return to the uh, z-axis. For instance, if you go to 99%, then it's uh, about uh, 6.5 seconds. While with a 90 degree, you need a longer recovery time. And that's about 12 seconds. Um, However, you can also have long relaxating uh, systems and um, well, each spin uh, can be, uh, a, one molecule can have uh, several types of spin, but uh, typically for simple molecules, the relaxation time can also be quite long. So 10 seconds uh, T1 is not very unusual, but then you need uh, lot longer relaxation. So 47 seconds for a 90 degree pulse and 26 seconds for a, seconds for a 30 degree pulse. I will uh, um, work with a 10 second delay for the further uh, uh, presentation um, because typically you will have to wait for the longest relaxator. So if we plot this in time, you can see that uh, the number with the number of scans that the uh, signal to noise uh, increases. However, for a 90 degree pulse, uh, the increase is better than for a 30 degree pulse. You need approximately four times more scans to see, achieve the same signal to noise as uh, a 90 degree pulse with a 30 degree pulse. But we're not interested in how many scans we need. We're interested in how many, how much time we need to spend. So if we plot that, then you can see with a 30 degree pulse, uh, you start with only half of the signal to noise that you would have with a 90 degree pulse in a shorter time. But you will need almost two times as much time to get to the same level of uh, uh, signal to noise. The same goes for pulses in between, um, going to 45 degrees or 90 degrees. Uh, 90 degrees gives the best results. So to conclude, um, use a simple pulse program. If possible, use a ZG. Um, 
if pre-saturation is needed, use as minimal power as needed, uh, not to make it more cosmetically beautiful, but um, just to make um, only the barren necessities. Uh, also check that your receiver gain is not too high. That will uh, give a lot of additional interference in your uh, signals and uh, makes quantification more difficult when you're doing the integration. Check your 93 pulse and also determine your T1s in a relevant matrix. This can change as well. With that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. I acknowledge my colleagues from DSM that have been uh, doing uh, QNMR much longer than I have and uh, have provided me uh, with a lot of these slides. Now the floor is open for your questions.